Welcome to CC Family. We pray today's service you inspires you to walk closer to Jesus. Whether you're watching from Facebook or YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe and follow our pages to stay connected. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit that notification bell. We're glad you're here. Lord God, I'm going to open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 4. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God's sovereign Lord. They said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Repeat after me, and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to, to heal and perform signs, wonders, and miracles to the name of your holy servant Jesus. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs, wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Their prayer of this group of believers was consistent with the will of God. When we pray the will of God, we're unstoppable. Amen. They were unified. They were of one accord. The believers were believing for souls to come into the kingdom. They were concerned with winning souls. Everything else, including persecution, was of secondary importance. They were about begin, bringing the kingdom of God to earth. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As we have mentioned before, the environment was hostile. They were being actively persecuted from every direction, but instead of being discouraged, they prayed for bonus to speak the word of the Lord. Persecution will force a decision on your part. It will either drive you closer to Jesus or it will drive you away. There is no in between. Persecution will reveal lukewarm Christians. It will reveal those who are in it just for the bread and the fishes. This group does not just ask for circumstances to change. No, they prayed that they would, they would be changed in and through their circumstances. Amen. Praise God. I have spent so much of my life praying for circumstances to change, but then I found out that it was I who needed to change. Hallelujah. We will go through the waters. They will not overtake. We will go through the fire, and the flame will not burn in us. Instead of asking for the fire to be put out, ask God to make you fireproof. In Jesus' name, see what happened to the apostles Peter and John on Acts chapter 3 was on their way to the temple at the hour of prayer. They had come across a lame beggar. The lame man asked for money, but instead of getting money, he received what no amount of money could ever buy. He received his healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone knew this man who used to sit at the gate called the beautiful for about 40 years. But that, day, but that day his life changed forever. He went into the temple courts for the first time in his life, jumping and leaping and praising God. Hallelujah. Because of this healing, the community was shaking. They came to see how this man that they all knew had received his healing. We find in Acts chapter 3, while the man, while the man meaning the lame, who was lame, held on to Peter and John, all of the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why does this surprise you? I declare that the signs, wonders, and miracles should not be surprising when we declare the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Why do you stare at us as if it was by our own power of godliness that we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he decided, had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but you raised him, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see, and no was made strong. It is Jesus' name and faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold all through the prophets, saying that this Messiah will suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah whom he has appointed for you, even Jesus. 
Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he has promised long ago through his holy prophets. But for Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. See, the apostles Peter and John preached with great authority the word of God. The miracle of the healing of the lame beggar sparked a spontaneous crusade. Yeah. Members of the Sanhedrin, the religious elite, they saw how the apostles were teaching the people. Then they seized the apostles, but the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. 5,000. This is not counting women and children, so we can safely infer or assume that the number of people saved was at least 12,000 people. One miracle equals 12,000 salvations. One miracle equals 12,000 salvations. Talk about God getting the glory for what he did through the hands of the apostles. Talk about a very handsome return for a miracle. Are you with me? If you purpose in your heart that you will give Jesus the glory for the miracles that happen and you will preach the word with boldness. God will use you in unimaginable ways. It's when we, we try to, at times to use the miracles to promote our ministries. No, no, no. We need to use the miracles to promote the giver of the ministry and his name is Jesus. The strategy was to heal the sick and speak the word of God with boldness. This is run in line with the prayer of the group of believers in Acts chapter 4. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. The formula for effective evangelism is healing signs and wonders together with a bold preaching of the word. If you're wondering how you can reach the lost, the approach is described here. Ask the Lord to give you eyes to see. Ask God for opportunity to share the message of salvation. Look for the point of need and address it in prayer. Look for the point of need and address it in prayer. I, listen, it's going to be hard. Somebody that is sick at the end of the rope, the doctors could not do any. There are people like that all over the place. They couldn't find it. But in the name of Jesus, if you will just go and pray, the worst thing can happen is nothing happens. But what if it does? Hallelujah. Jesus will honor his name and there's a purpose in praying for the sick. It's not just a healing, but it's salvation. God will show up and show out, and that will give you a platform to share the Word of God. Miracles will open the doors of hearts to receive the Messiah. It's not by mind nor by power, but by His Spirit. And miracles settles the argument. In this fallen world where suffering and sickness prevail, miracles bring hope and salvation. These believers saw themselves as servants. Grant your servants boldness. Grant your servants boldness. Amen? These believers saw themselves as servants. This is very important. In our democratic, westernized mentality, we tend to think that everyone is equal. Right? Equality sounds like a very noble idea, but let me just... There are equal opportunities, but not equality. You see? You see what I'm saying? Uh, the raging mobs are demanding equality. Everyone seems to want a share of the pie. This mentality has even infiltrated the church. The verse that some believers quote is what Jesus said in John 15, 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. Now, Jesus has certainly called us friends. The reason for this is that he shares with us his business. Everything that Jesus learns from the Father, he has made known to us. What an honor and privilege. We must not take this for granted. So we are called friends in terms of the access to information. We're called friends because we have access to information that Jesus has. Amen. But being friends does not mean equality of status, access, resources, glory, or power. Let me say that again. But being friends does not mean equality of status, access, resources, glory, or power. But what we need to understand is that Jesus is not just a common friend. He is a king who happens to be your friend. Amen. Do you have or have you ever had a friend in high places? If you do, then you're aware of the honor it is to have a friend of such caliber. I have friends in some high places, but they're not my buddies. To be a friend does not mean that you become a buddy. There is a big difference between the two. There are friends that I honor, respect, and treat with high 
honor. I need to guard my heart lest I begin to bring these friends down to my level. Remember that familiarity breeds contempt. I even have access to information that they willingly share that I choose to protect. Being a friend of someone in high status does not automatically make me of high status. Can God trust you with such friends? Can he trust you not to utilize their relationship for self-gain or self-promotion? We often tend to use others for our own agendas. Access to some exclu... See, this is not... This is not right. With certain friends comes access to exclusive places and people. Be trustworthy. Do not utilize others for your own good. Let God be the one that promotes you. Amen? Would you be willing to allow the heart of God to manifest through you in your relationships? Famous people are looking for the real. Famous people are looking for the real. They're tired of people fawning over them or being starry-eyed. They have been utilized for the gain of others one too many times. The desire to be normal, they just want something that money or fame cannot buy. Being famous or important can be a very lonely endeavor. Are you able to minister to people like this without expecting anything in return? Are you able... Are you able to minister to people like this? The King of kings and the Lord of lords calls us friends. But like I said before, Jesus is king. He has, he is, has been, and will always be king. He's not an elected official. Before Jennifer's Genesis was, he was. He has no beginning and no end. We need to stop trying to understand kingdom principles with a democratic mindset. We honor, revere, and hold in high esteem our king. Because he is king, we are his servants that happen to be friends of the king. Being a friend of the king does not give us license to conduct ourselves any way we want in his presence. The other scripture that some mention is Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Another translation speaks about approaching God's throne of grace with boldness. I have heard some believers praying with an attitude there, demanding things from God, but they forget that we are servant friends. The Bible says in Psalm 51, 16, you do not delight in sacrifice or I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice of God, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise Remember that you're approaching a heavenly, holy, and pure throne and not a complaint department. This is not even a benefits office. Like I did my time in the military, so I went to the Veterans Affairs office to find out what my benefits. Come on now. Because we're looking for the benefits without the responsibility. Benefits without responsibility is poor stewardship. You see, we need to be conscious that with the benefits comes great responsibility to steward the benefits correctly with the heart of the king. It is called a throne because there is a king on it who reigns and rules supreme over the universe. If we look at the rest of the verse, it says again, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So when we approach it with confidence, with boldness, it's so that we may receive what? Mercy. How many here need mercy? All of us, at one time or another, mercy and find grace to what? To help us. When you approach God's throne of grace, you need help. You go there because you need help because you cannot do it on your own. You don't have what it takes, but you got Jesus. Amen? In our time of need. Amen? We can approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace. Notice that it does not say we can storm into the benefits and complaint department of heaven with bonus. No, it says that we approach. The word approach is to come near or nearer to. What the word approach implies is that we were not near. It means that we were far. What it means is that the throne is a place of exclusivity. Not everyone is allowed. Those who are allowed to approach the throne of grace are those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth call the uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at what... At, 
At that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in this world. But now in Christ, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Yeah. Say with me, approach. I'm going to approach the throne. We must approach the throne with confidence but with care. We were far away. We did not have a way. We were not acceptable, but now we're acceptable. We were all aliens and strangers, but now we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So our ability to approach the throne of God with bonus is because we're washing the blood of Jesus. Jesus paid the price for our being able to approach the throne of grace. When we approach, we do so with great care. We're not there to make demands, but our mission is to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Bonus and confidence are needed to approach the holy throne of God. We do so because we understand that our righteousness is not our own, but our, of the Lord. Anyone who approaches the throne in the wrong manner will die. In the Old Testament, the Holy of Holies was symbolic of the throne. The, priest could only, the high priest could only go in once a year. If he was not observant of the proper protocols, he would die. The tradition states that they would tie a rope around the ankle of the high priest. In case that he died, they could pull him out because if they go in there to try to remove the body, they would fall, there would be several more dead bodies. Remember the story of the book of Esther. The background is that evil Haman has conspired to have all the Jewish people of the kingdom to be murdered and plundered. Queen Esther was in the palace. She was approached by her aunt, uncle Mordecai, who asked her to go to the king and ask for help. The only problem was that whoever would show up where the king was located without being summoned by the king would be put to death unless the king extended the golden scepter. The following verses describe what happened next. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back his answer, Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows that you have come to the royal position for such a time as this. We know what happened. Esther and her attendants went to a fast. The, the day finally arrived when, for her to approach the uninvited to the court of the king. This would be certain death for Esther. No one was spared. We find this in Esther chapter 5. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes. Say with me, she put on her royal robes. And she stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. The king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given you. When Esther showed up in her royal robe, the king was pleased with her and held out the golden scepter. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Queen Esther put her life on the line for her people. Today, when we approach the throne of God, we must be dressed in righteousness. There is a purpose for you approaching the throne. It's not just for yourself or for people. It's for souls. You cannot just bring in your things. you got to think of others. When you go into the courts of heaven, you got to be prepared. you got to dress with Jesus. When you approach, you better have an agenda in mind. You need to be specific when you ask, Lord, souls, give us souls, Jesus. You see, our righteousness is our own. Our righteousness is of the Lord. The Bible further states that Jesus is God's scepter. Hebrews chapter 8, but about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointed you with the oil of joy. When we approach the throne of God, we know that he has already extended Jesus, who is our righteousness. God is on the throne, but he extended the scepter of God, which is Jesus, down to earth so that we could touch him and be saved and found grace and find life. We have found favor with God. Favor is, amen, is unmerited, unmerited favor. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 5, therefore, since we have been justi justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ 
through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. In today's world environment where Christianity is considered a threat, there is the drive to counsel true believers and on fire churches. I know places in the world where becoming a Christian will cost you your job, becoming a Christian will cost you to lose your house and your possessions. Becoming a Christian can even cost you your very life. Like Queen Esther, many of us may have put it all on the line. What we need to realize is that God is the one who orders our steps. We know that we have favor with God. We have favor with God. Remember that we cannot draw our identities from our titles or positions. We cannot have our identities based on nationalism. The Bible clearly states in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven. Repeat after me, but our citizenship is in heaven. Say it again, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. Here on earth, we have been born into a specific geographic location. As a result, we're citizens of that particular nation that we were born into. With our earthly citizenship, citizenship there are rights, privileges, and responsibilities. This is the reason why there are international borders. As earthly, earthly citizens, we live under the laws of a particular nation. But as Christians, once we have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, we have acquired a new citizenship, which supersedes our earthly citizenship. Hallelujah! We're now citizens of heaven. This is why believers from all over the world have a common nation of origin. Glory to God. Our nation is a heavenly one. We have become citizens of the kingdom of God. We are now subjects of King Jesus. With our heavenly citizenships, the citizenship, their rights. The Bible says in John chapter 1 verse 9, the true light that gives light to, to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the, the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He made the world and he went among men, the creation, that creation did not recognize him because he became totally human. I'm going to that a little bit more. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. Say with me, I am born of God. We have been given the right to become children of God. We're not of natural descent. When Jesus saved us, we have a supernatural lineage. There is a new lineage. We have been born of God. We have gone from death to life eternal. With this supernatural event, we have acquired a new identity, a new nature. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them we may participate in the divine nature. Say, so that we may participate in the divine nature. Say it again, so that we may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. As stated above, we have been allowed to participate in the divine nature. We have an earthly nature, hallelujah, but when, when we came to Jesus, we, then we are participants of the divine nature. This ability to participate in the divine nature is made possible by God's divine power. Only divine power can produce divine nature. Only divine power can produce divine nature. Only divine power can produce divine nature. How can it be that divine nature can be produced out of fallen, sinful nature? It's a mystery. But God, who is the giver of life, has determined to be so. This is what separates true Christianity from lukewarm, compromised Christianity. This is what separates true Christianity from all other religions in the world. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus. In John chapter 14, verses, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I have mentioned it before, we'll mention it again. If God ever had a logistical issue, it was how to send Jesus, his son, who is eternal, divine, and all-powerful into the world. 
He sent him not in his divine nature, but bade him participant of the earthly nature. Are you with me? Don't, don't check out on me. If we look at Emmanuel, it means God with us. The Bible says in Philippians 2, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, Jesus would have, could have considered equality with God something to be grasped. Instead, he made himself nothing. He actually took on the nature of a servant. He was made in human likeness. At the cellular, molecular level, in each of the cells of Jesus' body, there was half of the human genome and half of God's genome. How could it be that human chromosomes were able to stand side by side next to a genome of perfect, holy molecules? That is a mystery to me. It's a miracle that God chromosomes in the body of Christ could exist along with human chromosomes in the same space, but Jesus had to allow his acquired humanity to be expressed and his divinity to be suppressed. Are you following with me? Otherwise, it would not have been fair. It would not have fulfilled their requirement. Jesus faced temptation and overcame. He lived in a fallen world after having made himself fallible. He walked in and around sin without partaking of sin. This is hard for us to imagine. God partook through Christ in our human nature for a little while. The Bible says, and I'll prove it to you, Hebrews chapter 2. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both, salva both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here I am. The children God has given me, since the children have flesh and blood, he too, sh he too shared in their humanity. Let me say that. He, meaning Jesus, too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For surely it's not to angels. It's not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. Who are Abraham's descendants anyway? Us! Not only the natural descendants of Abraham, but we are descendants of Abraham by faith. We have been grafted into the lineage spiritually. Hallelujah! Because everything God does, he does with a purpose. Hallelujah! For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way. How would Jesus was made? He was what? Made fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he, him, he himself suffered when he was tempted. Just stop right there. He was... He suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus made me lower for a little while, lower than the angels. How could the greatest of all become the less? He was made less for a little while. The one who lives in eternity became subject to time. He lived in time. He operated in time. The, the one outside of time stepped into time as someone less than, than who he really is. So no one, the one who created time, who lives outside of time, step into time became less than who he is. I want you to think about this with me because my mind is having, my brain is just shorting out. 
but the one who always, who fills everything in every way, the one who was there before the foundations of the world, step into time. He did not supernaturally appear as a man, but he went into the womb and waited nine months because he became subject to time. And then he was born, he was born in a manger, he was raised, he had to learn obedience to his parents. So those of us who have dealt with rebellion here and there, or you rebellion young adults, the teenagers, not a problem, it's the young adults that I worry about because they know enough to get into trouble, but not enough to know what's going on. Listen to me. He had to learn obedience, become subject to the parents because he had to learn the honor. Because God entrusted Mary and Joseph with the task of raising his son. I'm blown away. So he became all that so that he could be tempted. How could he be tempted unless he didn't? He had to have the ability to fall if he wanted to. But he chose not to. My God, that gives us all hope, doesn't it? That gives me hope. Come on, Jesus. He could have lied, but he didn't. Because the Word of God says that he's the truth. The truth would not tell lies. Come on now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, the one outside of time, step into time as someone less than who he really is, Oh, the love and forbearance of God, the one who could not suffer, suffered and thus became perfect through suffering. The one who's perfect became less, and so he attained perfection again through suffering. He too shared in their humanity. If he was not human, he would not have been, would not have been able to die. So in order to die, he became subject to death. In doing so, by his death, he broke the power of the devil over those who were held captive by the fear of death. Jesus did not help angels, but Abraham's descendants. And we know that, that all of us are Abraham's descendants by faith. Today, I want to encourage all the sound of my voice to understand that we are servant friends of the greatest king of all ages. I'm going to ask the um, worship team to come up. We have been given access to the throne of God through Jesus, the Son. And just like the early believers in the book of Acts, we need to get our priorities straight. This is not about us. It's not about, it's not about me. This is about the king and what the king wants. What does the king desire? That none should perish, but that all should come to salvation. Are you with me? So, this is about the king. Being conscious of what the king desires will enable us to see past our temporary troubles and to fulfill the purpose for which we were born. And I'm going to end the message this way. First Peter chapter 2. Can you put that up? Who are you? You are a chosen people. Before we were conceived, we were chosen. I'm still trying to wrap my brain around that. <laughs> Everyone in the world was chosen before they were even conceived, before they were born. But yet when we step from a place of eternity before we were even conceived, we step into time. We come here temporarily so that we can make decisions about the rest of our eternity. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Before there was one priest, a high priest that could go and offer sacrifices, but now each one of us have access to the throne and we wear the robes of righteousness, which is our royal robes. We are what? A holy what? Nation. Not just a holy nation in the U.S., uh-uh. 
from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation because we have a common country of origin that we're waiting to see and to live. I want you to close your eyes for a moment because there is a country, there is a, a city not made by human hands whose foundations and architects is God Amen. that's waiting for you and for me. So in the meantime, we are to get ready. We are to get ready. We don't have all of eternity to do the will of God here on earth because we were eternal before we were conceived. Now we have stepped into time. There's stuff that we need to do in real time to go back to eternity. Your decisions in the temporary earth in real time will determine what you will do the rest of your life in eternity. What is it going to be? If we were more conscious of what everything we do and everything we determine in light of our eternity, how would your life look? Where would your investments be? I'm, I'm just saying. I know I'm beginning to meddle, but I, I need to say this. I need to say this. Listen, listen. We need to be about the king's business. I dare you to begin to look for the point of need. And go and pray and have the King Jesus bring glory and honor to his name. I know some of us may be shy, but listen, you can do it shyly. Just, can I just pray with you? It ain't going to hurt. I've yet to meet a patient of mine who refused prayer before I took him back to the And I'm not, look, I, I'm not like, said, do you believe in prayer? Would you mind if? They have every right to say no. I have yet to meet one person. Even so-called agnostics and unbelievers, when they're facing a knife, wants to close our eyes for a moment. From every tribe, every tongue, and every nation, our citizenship is in heaven. Look. There's a globalist agenda, but then there's a kingdom agenda. The globalists think that it's all the nations should be one, but from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation, there is a nation that is eternal. And we're citizens. We're every right, privileges, and responsibilities and as citizens of that eternal country. When we see a believer that speaks a different language, has a different skin color, we're of the same lineage of Abraham, and we recognize spirit to spirit. And when we get around the redeemed, there's something that happens in our lives. Our spirit man gets stirred. Whew. When I've been in Africa, I've been in France, I've been in Romania, and I see my brethren, I've been in Germany. It's the same spirit, it's the spirit of the living God. It's the same blood that washed me, has washed them as well. All we have is minor temporary uh, differences of culture, but we're under Christ. Those of us who were far, oh my God, was I ever far, but I was brought to here. I was brought near. I have been brought near. You have been brought near by the blood of the Lamb. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkles. Listen, in temporary earth, we can plunder hell to repopulate heaven. Are you with me, church? The fate of the demons is already sealed forever it's already been sealed but listen the eternity of men and women is yet to be determined what are we gonna do i want to challenge you i'm gonna challenge you i'm gonna dare you the signs wonders and miracles are not gonna be something strange it's gonna be an everyday occurrence 
if we purpose in our heart for souls. That's why I love what Brother Jimmy is doing because this is the missing link for a major move of God. It's an evangelism and discipleship arm here. We're going after souls. We're not going to dilute the gospel for them. We're going to give it to them like it is. We're not going to make it seeker sensitive. We're going to make it God, Jesus Christ centered. We cannot improve on the gospel. We cannot make it more palatable. It already is like honey to our lips. Let's stand up to our feet. I feel the presence of Jesus. My God, are you ready? Get ready. Get ready. Angels have been dispatched to help you.